Living Like Jesus, what a great message series for 2020. Every Sunday we're going to explore the lives of people in the New Testament who reveal what it really looks like to live like Jesus. Here's what John says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Well, Mari Mai and uh, that's about it, sorry. It's really great to be here in uh, Ellen Vannin. I uh, have been more times than 15 years ago, but um, last time uh, that I was here, I mean, the times I've come have tended to be very short just for um, political meetings, but it's really great to be back with you. And uh, 15 years ago, things were very different. We were um, uh, in uh, Port Elizabeth, and uh, uh, it was a, a, a totally different thing. It's great to see what you're doing, and taking the island by storm. Uh, and that's fantastic. God is, is blessing you and has blessed you and will bless you. And uh, it's a real privilege. I bring greetings from, from Guernsey um, uh, and our church there. Um, I hope this morning that um, God will use way to leave a blessing here for you. Um, Sometimes when uh, we're in the presence of God, and it was a real wonderful time of worship here and hearing the different languages being prayed uh, for the different nations of the world as well. But sometimes in, in those contexts, God speaks to me, um, and I sensed that he wants to heal some people here today. So I'm just going to uh, say what I think God has said. Um, we're going to leave it there, but if you want prayer at the end, I know there will be people here at the front that can, can pray for you, but you can receive right where you are now. I feel there's somebody that came in here with a pain in your right leg of some sort. In fact, it's causing you to limp. Um, and you haven't been to the doctor. It's not serious as such, but you're limping. And I sense that God not only wants to heal you, he wants to speak to you about that. There's a reason uh, whilst, uh, well, while he, wants to, he wants to heal you, but he wants to speak to you as well. Um, there's somebody here, um, you have had uh, pain in your ear. I'm not sure which one, but um, like a, a, sh a sharp uh, sound and a pain that is causing you difficulty. God wants to heal you as well. And then there's... It's not a healing as such, but I saw while we were worshipping, um, it was like somebody was sitting in a chair and reading a book, reading a story. And the page was about to turn to another chapter. It was the end of one and the beginning of another. But as you know, when you read a book, you need to turn the page, unless it's your Kindle or something like that. But even the Kindle, you need to swipe or that sort of thing. You need to turn the page. There was a physical need to turn the page, something that you do. And I sense God saying to you, if you're that person here this morning, there is a new chapter in your life. Uh, God wants to change things. It's still the same story. It's your story. But just like in a book, the reason that we have chapters is that something comes to an end, and maybe the characters continue into the next chapter, but it's a new chapter, and new elements will come in. And I sense for you today, Jesus, it's not accidental that you're here. Uh, there's a new chapter, and God wants you to respond, by, in a sense, by turning the page and saying, I receive this. It's a, it's a story of your life that God has written, a new chapter to emerge. So if, if that's you, if any of those things resonate with you, then it'd uh, be, be great to, to pray with you at the end. Um, I want to share uh, what we'll start this morning anyway in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible, congratulations. And, um, or an iPhone or something like that. Um, I'm going to read from the New King, New King James Version, but it doesn't really matter what version you've got. It might come up here as well. Um, we're going to read a few verses from uh, 1 Peter 2, to um, verse 9. Just a few verses from there. But you are a chosen generation. Just say that with me. You are a chosen generation. In fact, let's say we are a chosen generation. We are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. Holy nation. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who were once not a people, but are now the people of God. 
who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. Amen. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, so you might have uh, foreigners and aliens, or words to that effect, strangers and aliens, in the, instead of sojourners and pilgrims, but I beg you to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, um, I'm going to ask you a question that I quite often ask uh, when I'm around and about and preaching. And uh, as Jonathan said, um, we're involved very much in France. Uh, we planted our first church in the city of Rennes, in Brittany, uh, in the late 90s. Um, and then little by little, we've planted a few, adopted some, and sort of extended congregationally and things. Now we've got churches or church plants in 15 uh, cities and, and towns in Amen. France. Um, and one in Geneva and one in Brussels as well that is also uh, French-speaking or partly French-speaking. All the ones in France are totally French-speaking. So sometimes people say to me, I'm moving to France uh, or, 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 or to, a, to, to a town in France. Um, and uh, where, where's the nearest church I can go to? You recommend a church. So I say the name of a church that they could get to. They say, um, do they speak English? So I said, well, they might speak English, but, um, you know, uh, it's a bit like saying, well, you know, do they speak Swahili in France? I mean, uh, they, they worship in French. We want to reach the French people, and so yeah, we, right. when we send any missionaries over there, yeah. it's to speak French and reach the French people. They're not yeah. expats. Amen. I mean, there are English people in the churches, but we want to reach people where they're at. Amen? Amen. Because our Savior, Jesus, came down to earth and became like us. He became a human being. That's he associated with us. That's what missionaries do. So I was going to ask you this question. Um, put your hand up if you're a missionary here. It's just a bit of a trick question, isn't it, really? Okay. Um, I mean, really, everybody's hand should go up. Because the question isn't really, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, are you a missionary or not? The question is, are you a good missionary or a bad missionary? Wow. Yeah? Oh, please, so the, the phrase here, which you find in Peter, and it's not just unique to Peter. Paul uses the phrase, uh, and it's used in the book of Acts as well, where it talks about strangers and aliens or sojourners and pilgrims. It, when, when Peter says, I beg you as strangers and al aliens or sojourners and pilgrims, that, the two words there, but one particular word, the word for alien there, is a word in Greek which is very particular and very difficult to translate. It really means, it means uh, resident alien. Resident alien. And uh, uh, poroikos in, in Greek, it means someone who is living in a particular place but doesn't belong there. It's not a word for someone that is traveling through as such. Uh, or visiting a tourist. It's not that sort of word. It's somebody who's living in a place and, uh, but doesn't actually belong there. It's our citizenship is in heaven. When you come to follow Jesus, you change your citizenship. You belong somewhere else. And, you know, that's not a frightening thing. It's a great thing. Paul uses yeah. the same word when he says, uh, to, you are no longer strangers and aliens to the covenant of God. You, we are people that have come into, in Ephesians, you'll, Ephesians 2, uh, uh, verse 19, you'll read, read that. We are no longer, we're accepted in, into God. We're not strangers and aliens. But, but Peter here and elsewhere, and it links into the Old Testament, which we'll look at in a moment, is saying, actually... In this world now, if you're following Jesus, you don't belong here. You are temporary resident. Yeah. Right? Good. So you, you are an, a, a resident alien. Just turn to the person next to you and say, you are a resident alien. <laughs> My, uh, I've got three daughters. Um, they're all pretty much grown up now. Two of them are married. Uh, we've got one grand grandson another one on the way in a couple of weeks time uh which is why i want to get home to guernsey uh tomorrow if i can 
um, and I've got a young daughter as well. But when they, they were all born in Guernsey, and my wife Judith comes from London, and they used to like to tease uh, Judith that on our marriage certificate, I don't know if it's the same here in the Isle of Man, but on our marriage certificate, where it, where it said national, well, nationality and that sort of thing. For me, obviously, I was a Guernsey born and bred, but it said alien for, for Judith. Uh, <laughs> this comes from the old French, and uh, so, you know, they said my mother's an alien. Um, but, but we are resident aliens. Now, it's interesting that Paul, uh, sorry, Peter here, uh, is saying, He's, he's telling us is that there's a way that we are to live if we understand that we are resident aliens here in this world. And it's an important way. He's talking about our conduct, our behavior, verse 12, among the Gentiles. And by that, he means those who don't follow Jesus. And then he says this amazing thing, that when they speak against you as evildoers. Now, let's just think about that. Peter is saying, when, not if. He's saying when the, the world outside looks, as you, looks at you as a follower of Jesus and speaks against you as an evildoer, when that happens, it's important that your behavior is such that the way you live, the choices you make, the things you do, it's important because you are Citizenship is not here, it's in heaven. It's important that even though they will say some stuff to you and you think, that's so wrong, I want to defend myself and I want, to, I want them to know that they're wrong. I'm not an evil person, I follow Jesus. Well, even when that happens, there will come a day, it's, he calls it the day of visitation, when they will glorify God because they will have seen your good deeds. Now, we're not saved by our good deeds. Amen? Amen. Right? We're saved by grace. Yeah, but we are called to good deeds. Yeah, right. There is a purpose right. to the grace of God at work in Jesus. Yeah. And it is to produce in us, because we're free from the penalty of sin and all the condemnation that comes with that, hallelujah, Amen. to produce good things. And it matters. And it, he's taking it for granted that even though we're doing that, there will come times when people say, they accuse us of all sorts of stuff. And they make life difficult for us as followers of Jesus. I believe we're living in days when that will become more and more the case. Yeah. Now, beloved, it's important when that happens that we are ready to listen to this and say, ah, oh, wait a minute, I'm a stranger and an alien in this world. And I don't belong here. And so I'm bound to get criticism. I'm bound to have a hard time. But I'm called to serve Jesus in it, so that even if people are saying that against me at the moment, one day will come when they say, wait a minute, I saw what they were doing, and I realize now that, that what they were doing was, was the right thing in Jesus, because they were doing it because they were followers of Jesus. Amen. And that's what we are here to do. I want us to turn to the book of Daniel, because I think when we talk about being missionaries, so often we think of missionaries, and it's probably why most of us didn't put our hands up, but we think of missionaries as somebody that leaves their home country and uh, goes into a foreign country to take the message of Jesus, yeah? Um, but uh, we're living in an age where really, where you, when you stay at home, where we are in the West, the world around us, the culture around us is changing so rapidly that you don't need to go anywhere. It is just foreign now when That's you look right. around, yeah? yeah? Because the remnants of uh, Christian ethics in the world are just dying fast, rapidly. Mm. And that in some ways is sad and it's one of the things which pr prompted me to get involved in politics. But I'm not involved in politics to win debates. And we shouldn't be involved in anything to, to win in that sort of way. I'm, I'm there to win hearts and minds. That's right, yeah. And I recognize that I will do that more through my behaviors and the way in which I choose to live honoring Jesus, being filled with his Holy Spirit and recognizing that what God does in me and through me is far more powerful than, than I can imagine or, or do if it was just down to my own being. That, that's what matters the most. Well, in the book of Daniel, and we're going to read, uh, well, probably actually most of the first chapter. So um, we'll just read this. I I'll just recap a bit of the story because we're going to rush through it a little bit. Um, what we have here is uh, a country, uh, 
Israel had, uh, had, had split into two. The kingdom of Judah uh, had been taken uh, under the uh, empire, the largest empire the world had known at the time, the Babylonian Empire. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar was the head of that empire. And uh, the, 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 the Judeans had revolted. And uh, so Nebuchadnezzar decided that the only way he was going to control this uh, rebel people was to take drastic action. And we're just going to read uh, some of the, the, the first chapter of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understanding, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans." And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah there were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart, listen to this, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested to the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And, as you see fit... So deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine which they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for the four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought into, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. I believe this story, uh, and I encourage you to read Daniel if you haven't. We know Daniel the lion's den, all that sort of stories. But actually there's a lot of detail here. It's a story for our time. Because can you imagine what it would have been like? Nebuchadnezzar thought, I, I, I'm going to deal with this rogue nation once and for all. I'm not just going to uh, qu uh, quash their rebellion. I'm going to take from amongst them some of the best young people and or the king's family so that never again are they going to find a leader rising up amongst them. And I'm going to bring them to Babylon and I'm going to take them through Babylon University and I'm going to give them all the culture of Babylon so that they will become used to Babylon and they will speak our language, and that they won't be encouraged to lead or to take on a rebellion anymore in Judah. That was his plan. It was a good military st uh, strategy. He used it since many, many leaders have done so. But he happened to choose upon young people here, young men, who actually really knew God, 
And so they were, must have been people who understood that uh, the prophecy that Jeremiah had given, and if you read that, um, let me just refer to it now, in, uh, in Jeremiah, if I can find it. Um, when Jeremiah says to, to the people in, in prophesying about what is, what is going to happen, uh, he says, this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles who were carried from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Seek the prosperity of the city which I have sent you as exiles. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For if it prospers, you too will prosper. And then he goes on to say, do not be deceived by prophets and diviners amongst you. Because actually, many of the people, the exiles who left Jerusalem and went to Babylon, they refused to go into the city. Babylon was a, a huge, great city. We were very different, probably the... A, 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 as Daniel and, and his companions arrived, they saw these huge, great ziggurat towers. Um, it was full of gold. It had um, uh, idols on every street corner. I mean, for a Jew arriving there, it would have been an anath anathema. It, it, it was like Las Vegas on steroids. <laughs> you can imagine Daniel and his uh, com companions thinking, what have we come to? All these different gods and all this luxury and gold and all these huge, great... Uh, you know, there was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the built for the, uh, the, one of the wives of the, of the king because she was a country girl and uh, you didn't have gardens in the city, so he, he built uh, gardens just specifically for her. But there were some that refused to go into the city. And Psalm 137 talks about that. There's some that stayed by the rivers. You know that song? By the rivers of Babylon. Remember that one? Yeah. yeah? Well, I mean, we, we sing that bit of it. Um, you know, it says how, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, we remembered Zion, we hung up our harps, because some of the, you know, the Babylonians are saying, sing us some of your Jew, Jewish songs. We like those sort of <laughs> Jewish dances and songs. And they were, they were saying, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Yeah? yeah. Now, you can have sympathy with them, the bit that we don't sing is near the end of that psalm where it starts, uh, so it's, it talks about how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, Psalm 137. But then it says uh, in verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little babies against the rock. We don't tend to sort of uh, sing that bit of it. You know, horrific scenes. Happy the one who dashes your children, your little babies, against the rocks. It's part of the psalm. Yeah. This is because they were taken out of their culture and taken to a completely non-believing culture, a culture of many, many different gods, gods for everything that you needed in life, a culture that was totally foreign to them, and they, they despaired of it. And yet, Jeremiah, said when you get there this is God's will for you because the people of God had actually turned from the, the ways of God that's why God had taken them into exile it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar God had ordained their exile they went out there and Daniel and his friends perhaps only Daniel and his friends saw that and they saw that there was a reason why they were there and they were going to be obedient to that they were going to bless the city now how did they do that well let's, let's have a look at it they well, first of all, there was going to be all sorts of problems with the food and things there because clearly the food in that um, culture and the drink, many of it, ma many of the, those foodstuffs and drinks would have been offered to gods. They would have been part of the religious worship of foreign gods. Now, Daniel and his friends would have, could have picked upon a number of different reasons um, and issues to say we don't want to take part in this uh, part of it. They only chose one as far as we can make out. I mean, they could have, they could have, it was wrong for a, a Jew to walk past any idol without tearing it down. That was, that was part of the Jewish culture. If you saw an idol, you had to tear it down. It, it, Daniel only chose to 
say, well, I'm, we're not going to have this food that has been the meat and the wine that has been offered to gods. And the way he goes about that is actually very interesting. So he, the chief of the eunuchs is like the, the, uh, the emperors, the, the king's the chief of staff. And we won't go into the sexual issues of the eunuchs at the moment, but, um, but it's chief of staff. So he, 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 he talks to the chief of staff and he says, look, um, we're not going to eat this stuff that's been offered to, to idols. So um, we'd rather you don't give it to us. Now, that was a problem for the chief of staff because he said, well, ah, crumbs, you're going to look emaciated and ill if you don't do that. And Daniel said, give it a try. Let's do it for 10 days. And if it doesn't work, well, we'll go back to where we were before. But at the end of 10 days, of course, Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better than those that uh, were the normal people eating the, the normal food and wine at the king's table. So what he had done is proven that his God was in charge, Amen. that his God was sovereign, and it wasn't down to his diet. I don't think Daniel here is saying vegetarianism is the best way forward, because that isn't part of Jew Jewish... <laughs> I knew I'd get some amens for that. that. That isn't part of Jewish culture. It's not that. He's saying here, I'm choosing something here to show you that I'm not going to compromise. At the same time, they became they learnt the language, he went through university effectively three years, learned all the culture there, and as you know from the rest of Daniel, he became, and his friends became, some of the best advisors to the king there. See, we're living in a foreign land, bit, a bit like for us for Daniel, we haven't gone a thousand miles to a different place, but now the environment around us, the culture around us is totally different than what it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. We look around, and things that would have been heinous and uh, uh, would, have, would have raised eyebrows at the very least from people in the culture around us who probably weren't followers of Jesus but nevertheless had that background, nowadays uh, you just you'd blink. You just don't care. Uh, look at the advertising that goes on today. Look at the internet and all of that. I mean, a culture around us is the most foreign to Christian culture than probably it's been uh, for centuries. Now, how do Christians respond when the culture around them has changed and is, is different and is sometimes oppressive and sometimes hostile to the Christian message? Well, Andy Crouch, in his really good book, uh, Culture, um, culture Making, which uh, I encourage you to read that, he, he talks about four different ways in which Christians over the centuries have responded to that. And I'm just going to highlight some of them now. And I think it's quite useful for us because we can respond this way sometimes. Now, there's good parts of these four different ways, but the trouble is when they become uh, not, when they, instead of when they become responses that are not done in a, um, a, a deliberate and thoughtful uh, uh, fashion, when they become postures, that are positions that we take, that's when the dangers arrive. So, the first is this, that we can, as Christians, condemn the culture around us. Now, brothers and sisters, sometimes it's right to condemn things in the culture around us. Human trafficking, sex slavery, it's right for us to condemn that. I'm not saying that's the case, but let's just take some examples from the 20th century. So, for example, in the, about 100 years ago, when the cinema industry and theatres started taking off, many Christians just condemned all of it. Yeah? In fact, I grew up in a, a sort of little evangelical bubble in, in Guernsey where you certainly didn't go to the cinema on a Sunday, uh, right? And you certainly, uh, if, you, if you did, it went to the cinema at all, you, you, did it, you, you talked about it in hushed tones. So it was still around in the 1960s and 70s. But, um, but 100 years ago, many Christians, when they saw the rise of this uh, in Hollywood and uh, all of that entailed, they condemned it. They threw rocks at it and said this is terrible, and it's ungodly, and it's going to produce all sorts of things. Condemnation is a, a, a position that historically many Christians have taken when they see the culture around them become ungodly and unbiblical. I mean, it's sometimes the cause of Christians to retreat from culture. It was uh, the rise of the 
It caused the rise of the monastic movement. People decided to live outside of cities, outside of the urban environment, uh, in, the, uh, in, in monasteries and in little communes, which they saw as safe, where they could keep their Christian values because they saw the, the world in the city as being nasty and bad and evil and sinful. Yeah? Condemnation is not engagement with culture. It's removal from culture and throwing stones at the culture. You can't be a missionary and condemn the culture around you. You with me? The second that uh, Andy Crouch talks about, the second position, is to critique. Now, this is slightly better. People like, in the 20th century, like uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer has done this sort of thing. That is to look at art and to look at culture around and to say, well, this bit is quite interesting and that story is quite relevant, but that's not so good. And that. But it becomes an intellectual thing where, you, again, you don't really engage with it so much. And it certainly, as Christians, it doesn't help us to... Uh, uh, to invade the culture, which is what we're called to do as missionaries. The third, this happened in the 1960s and 70s particularly, is to copy the culture. I mean, what happened with Christian music? You know, why has the devil got all the best music? Remember that, that, that sort of idea around? So we copy the, the sort of music of rock and roll and all that sort of stuff. I mean, the, the, the trouble with contemporary Christian music is it's, it's not, we all know, it's not contemporary. It's about five to ten years behind or all the rest of the stuff. But nevertheless, it's copying what's around. And, uh, well, uh, you know, if, the, if, if that culture around is, uh, some of it's okay, so let's use some of it in our Christian uh, setting. That isn't particularly good, although some of it can be useful in, in certain settings because it doesn't differentiate ourselves from the world around. And God wants us to be different, beloved. He wants us. Daniel and his friends chose right from the start that there would be certain things that they would choose to be different. They weren't going to compromise on. God is calling us today not to compromise on everything. And the fourth area that Andy Crouch talks about is, is becoming consumers. And that is, we've seen probably in the last couple of decades, is where, sadly, the, many Christians have just are just blended with the rest of the society. Now, I'm not suggesting we go back to wearing our Sunday best on a, on a Sunday like I did. I always had a, uh, when I was a young boy, had a suit to wear to go to the Methodist church that I went to on the Sunday and that sort of thing. I'm, I think it's fine that we dress like, you know, when Christians don't dress like the rest of the community, that is very odd. But, but nevertheless, um, we are not called just to be consumers where there's nothing that makes us any different. That's right. Right? Yeah. You are called to be different because you are citizens of a different place. Right. You're citizens of a different nation, of a different uh, environment, of a different set of rules and laws. We are under the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. We're not under this world. Yeah. And the story of Daniel is, is a story of, of people, Daniel and his friends, who chose to live in the world, in their culture. They didn't. Uh, leave it. They didn't. They weren't down by the rivers, um, uh, crying over what had happened in Jerusalem. They were choosing to take the message of their culture to the culture around them. Beloved, if we're going to be real missionaries today in this culture that's rapidly changing and can't even agree with itself, because it's very true to say we are in a multicultural environment, a multicultural uh, society. We need to be absolutely certain of the word of God and what God is choosing us to do. He wants us, the word here teaches us to bless those around, even if they're antagonistic towards us. How do I love those in my world, in my workplace as a politician, and the vast majority of people that I meet are not only non-Christian, they're at least slightly antagonistic towards Christianity. How do I learn to love them and bless them? It was a, quite a big shock to me. Um, I got elected first into our assembly in Guernsey 20 years ago. Um, and apart from a, a, a four-year gap when I chose not to stand, I've served in some form. I, when I was chief minister <coughs> and uh, responsible for foreign affairs at, at that time, I remember one of my first visits to Brussels to represent Guernsey. And um, I 
didn't want to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We never be ashamed of that. So my bio, which everybody we met got a copy of, I got copies of theirs, said, uh, Jonathan is um, an evangelical Christian pastor. And at one uh, lunch event, I will never forget, I was sitting there with a, a number of um, members of the European Parliament and uh, ambassadors and, and the like. We're having a very uh, convivial lunch. And uh, a member of the Green Party from Holland was sitting next to me. And he said, I've read your bio. I said, oh, oh good. I thought this, this is going to be interesting, I'm sure. He said, and let me get this straight. He said, you are a um, you're believing Christian. So I said, yes, that's right. He said, you're an evangelical believing Christian. So I said, yes. He said, amazing. Crazy. Crazy. He said, not only that, he said, you're an evangelical leader. You're a pastor. So I said, yes, that's right. He said, that means you really believe that stuff. <laughs> so I said, uh, uh, yeah, 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 I do, yeah. He said, so let's get this straight. He said, so you are the sort of person that, so you hate gays, you're down on women, and you approve of the abuse of children. Oh. He wasn't joking. I had 15 minutes to try and undo some of that. And I realized that, his world view of Christianity was so totally different. I had to change my language to speak to him. You with me? Yeah. Missionaries, if they go to France or to India, they change their language. They want to reach the people there. Yeah, that's what we were saying earlier. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn a new language for the world. Around. I, I don't call myself a Christian in my bio anymore. That might sound like a very negative thing, but I, I say I'm a follower of Jesus. Now, I prefer that, actually. A Christian was, was only invented uh, a word that was used later on in that, but followers of the way or followers of Jesus were, was quite common. Now, what I find, strangely enough, even though it's probably more explicit than saying a Christian, that people say, that's interesting. It says in your bio you're a follower of Jesus. What does that mean? <laughs> and I get into a conversation with them because many of them, they haven't got a problem with Jesus. They don't really know much about him. But I don't need to get into what the media has portrayed in terms of Christianity yeah. and the church and right-wing evangelicals and the like. I don't need to get into that when I'm conversing on that basis. Okay. I'm learning how to communicate to this gospel around. I'm still a learner, but I encourage you to be a learner, just as Daniel and his friends were learning how to do that. Yeah. Let me tell you a, 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 an encouraging story that's come as a result of that. I wish I had more of these, but here's, here's one. So, and another trip uh, actually to Brussels uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I had had another one of those uh, meetings and there was a different group of people at the lunch event and I got into conversation with somebody near me and there was another guy that was sitting opposite who I didn't really get introduced to but I recognized him and he occasionally asked a couple of questions in that but I didn't think any more of it. It was like when you go to a dinner party or something like that and you don't know, you don't quite remember because you haven't said very much, but he talked across the table, and that was it, and it just dis disappeared from my memory. Six months later, I was there, and I was at an event where I'd, I'd spoken, and the chief minister of Jersey had spoken, and we had about 100 people in the room, uh, various uh, representatives from, from different European nations. And I was speaking to the German ambassador, and as I was speaking to him, this very rude person came to my elbow and, st and started sort of shaking me by the elbow like this. And I thought, I dare he interrupt while I'm in the middle of conversing with an important person here. Um, and I looked around, and I saw this guy, and I said, well, excuse me, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking here. And he looked familiar, uh, but I couldn't quite place him. And then I realized it was that guy who was, had been sitting opposite me six months before. He was uh, a Slovak MEP, didn't know his name. Anyway, I said, we have to wait. Uh, I'm, I'm sp I haven't got much time, and uh, I need to finish this conversation with the German. Anyway, he said to me this, and this is what changed the whole thing. He said, I need to speak to you urgently. I need to speak to you about your God. Wow. Now, what I hadn't known um, was that uh, Stefan, his name, that six months before, when we had uh, been around the table, and probably not many people knew, he, his marriage was in a crisis, he'd had an affair, his wife was about to leave him, his, one of his daughters uh, 
had a serious drug problem and tried to commit suicide. And he had read my bio and he eavesdropped on the conversation I was having with somebody else. As a result of that, he, s he, looked, up, he looked up our church online, downloaded lots of sermons, listened to my series on Esther, which is quite remarkable because Esther is the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God, and got converted. Amen. Now, I, that evening I saw him back at my hotel. He was waiting there and, and, and he said, I, I did, he was in tears and he, he was one of the sort of, sorts of guys... It, the Holy Spirit was so at work on him that it didn't really matter what I said, he was going to give his life to Jesus, yeah, right? Yeah. I could have read a telephone directory out to him. He yeah. would still have given his life to Jesus. Amen. He was so ready. Now, what did I do? Nothing. I was just present. Beloved, we've got to be present in this yeah. culture. Amen. Amen. There's an incredible power when... God is present. We had it before. We've got it now. God is present in the place. But he's present in you. Yeah, yeah. When you go out there, Amen. when you go to your work, if you do yeah. tomorrow, and in your family and in your friendship yeah. groups, and that, all of that, God, when you're present, you've got to be present to do it. It doesn't take very much. Yeah. I often say I haven't got much in my briefcase. I, I, I didn't set out to be a politician. I don't really know what I'm doing most of the time. But I do know this, that God lives in me. Amen. I was a student in France. Um, I studied philosophy years ago. Not that I learned much from it. But we had a philosophy teacher at the Sorbonne in Paris who came in one day, and we were, it was a large theater, probably about three times the size of this. And he said, I want to show you something this morning. I'm going to ask you a question. He had a little candle, a tea light or something like that. And he said, I'm going to ask in a moment for all the lights to be turned off. Can this little candle light the room? And of course, none of us thought it could. We said, no, of course not. It's, it's far too tiny. Anyway, he asked for the lights to go off. He lit the candle and he put it there. And to begin with, he couldn't see much. And then suddenly, you began to see people's faces. You began to see, it was very dim, but it had an effect that was so pronounced. Brothers, it's so dark out there today that you might think your light isn't very bright. But it doesn't take very much Amen. to do that. Amen. Amen. God. Brothers and sisters, we have a power at work in us, and never mind what our faith is today, that can change the world around us. Amen. If you let the Holy Spirit do that. Yes. So I'm going to finish with a challenge. We're called to be not condemners of the culture, not critiques of the culture, not to copy the culture even, not to consume the culture. We are called to create Amen. the culture. And we do that by engaging with those around us. There's a wonderful um, statue in the uh, British Embassy in Washington, which has a picture of, Ch it's a statue of Churchill, and he's in movement. He's got his foot out like that. And that's because, um, you probably know, embassies are the only part of a country that belongs to a different country. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The laws in an embassy are not the laws of the land it's in. They're the laws of a different country. Yeah. And Churchill is, is, is a over the line of the British embassy into American soil. And it's that, that movement thing. And we are ambassadors here. We're, we're in the, the safety of the presence of God and the people of God. But we step over a line every time we go out into the culture out there that is different. And sometimes we'll be hostile. Yeah. And as Peter said right at the beginning, it's not if, it's when they speak evil of you. That's right. yeah. Yeah. We need to know we have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit Amen. working in us Amen. so that we're sent. Mm. Can I encourage you just to stand where Amen. you are? I'm going to pray for you. Amen. And then I'll hand back. Father, I pray for this wonderful church and this people that you have called to serve this place, this island, this nation, and this culture. And I pray that many missionaries will arise out of this uh, people, out of this group today. I pray many people will feel that call and will know that even if they feel their light is small, that they can make a massive difference in the darkness around them. But that we can see Daniels here to rise up, that will be willing to take a stand and not be ashamed and do so in a, in a civil way that honors uh, the people around, but at the same time says, God, 
Jehovah is my God. I follow Jesus. I don't follow someone else. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit so that there's no fear, for perfect love casts out all fear. And they will be equipped to see more and more people come to know Jesus as their Savior. Hallelujah. Amen.